Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. give you a sense of the current st state of affairs, so to catch you up on the latest discoveries and the current status of how many planets do we know about and how do we know about them. But, uh, but I'm not going to go into the details about what we have found, but instead I'm going to sort of use it as a backdrop towards the next generation of searches which we have to start doing in order to find lower mass planets. As, I'm, as you'll find out, almost all the planets we know about are really massive planets. And this talk is aimed towards the, the larger quest to find Earth-like planets, low-mass planets that are going to be, again, more like the Earth. The question of whether there are planets uh, outside our local area has been debated and discussed for you know, millennia. Uh, here's Epicurus, who was sort of one of the first documented philosophers to sort of get onto the right idea, at least what we think of. He lost the argument at the time to Aristotle, but he obviously turned out to be more right than Aristotle. Um, and we see here uh, this quote, there, the idea that there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. And we must believe that in all worlds there are living creatures and plants and other things we see in this world. Now, while we haven't gotten to this last stage of finding any living creatures or plants, for that matter, um, the idea that there are more worlds out there is, is very well established now, as you'll see. So what is a planet? It's, it may seem a pedantic thing. You probably think you all know what a planet is. But we can start at the time of Epicurus. We have the old astronomy definition of a planet here. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary. And a planet is a heavenly body distinguished from the fixed stars by having an apparent motion of its own among them. As you probably remember, planet comes from the Greek for wanderer. It is that they don't move with the celestial sphere with the rest of the stars. And you see, as of a few thousand years ago, there were seven planets. Uh, they were, of course, ordered in ex increasing distance from the Earth, which was the center of the universe back then, and it includes such uh, bodies as the moon and even the sun. <laughs> so, now this is a, the kind of planet you're probably used to thinking about. This is a schematic of our solar system. Uh, I'll be showing a few plots sort of like this, where, where we plot a sun is on the left, or a star, well, there's a scale here, and astronomical units. And I'll be using the abbreviation for that, an AU, all the time today. So an AU, an astronomical unit, is a basic unit in ast observational astronomy. And it's just defined as the distance between the sun and the Earth. So we see the outer planets here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So Pluto, the, the farthest planet in our solar system, you see is at about 40 astronomical units, OK, just for scale. The Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system, is at about 5 AU. So five times the Earth-Sun distance. So to see the, the so-called terrestrial planets, that is, planets like the Earth, we have to go zoom up on the inner few astronomical units. And we have uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all squeezed in here close to the star. So I'm making this distinction because we're going to be really talking about a simplified version of planets. And we're going to think about two kind of prototype planets. We're going to talk about Jupiter's, sort of extrasolar Jupiter-type planets, and we're going to talk about Earth-like planets. These are sort of the two kind of representative extremes of the situation I'm going to be referring to. So when I talk about a Jupiter or a Earth, I'm speaking generally for an Earth-like planet or a Jupiter-like planet. Here's what Jupiter looks like. It's about a thousandth of the mass of the sun. In terms of size, these are to scale. So Jupiter's diameter is about 11 times greater than the Earth. We'll come back to this drawing because it will become clear that it's going to be a lot easier to detect this than it's going to be to detect this. Someone's going to have to write a new entry for the OED pretty soon, I think. But according to the OED, the modern astro astronomy definition of a planet is the name given to each of the heavenly bodies that revolve in approximately circular orbits around the sun. And that's, of course, accurate for our planets and our solar system. Uh, we'll get to a more modern, a yet a more modern definition in a, in a minute. But as of 10 years ago, that was a perfectly adequate definition of a planet. 
Now, the first confirmed planets, I, I'm skipping actually a very rich history of false claims of pl finding planets. Uh, so don't get the idea that scientists always are corrected with these uh, discoveries. Uh, but the first confirmed extrasolar planets that everyone believes now was, were actually found around a pulsar. Now, a pulsar is a stellar remnant. It's the leftovers of a supernova explosion. Uh, they're neutron, fast rotating neutron stars that beam radiation towards us in a, in a basically like a clock. Uh, this is an audio version of the radio free signals from a pulsar. This is a, about a one hertz pulsar. So every, everything you hear is one time that this neutron star is spinning. And because they weigh so much, they weigh more than a solar mass, and they're spinning, the whole thing is spinning, as you can tell, quite fast for, that, for being so huge. It's extremely stable pulse. In fact, some pulsars are probably more stable than even the most sophisticated atomic clocks that we have on Earth, for instance. And they can be used for a variety of things uh, in terms of astrophysics and fundamental physics tests. So one thing you can do is measure, of course, the spacing of these, of these clock ticks, right? And Alec Walshan at Penn State found for this particular pulsar that it had some peculiar irregularities, that it wasn't totally steady in its pulses. Now, as an aside, pulsars are not perfectly steady. They, they tend to slow down you know, as they lose energy. But we can correct for that effect. It's a very regular amount of slowdown, and we know how to correct for that. And so if you correct for all these known uh, changes, you're left with irregularities. It's as if the clock is sometimes beating slightly ahead of, of schedule, and then sometimes it's, it's uh, beating a little slower than schedule, and then that, and that cycle repeats itself. And if you, and they analyzed this data and found that you could explain this result if this pulsar had around it three Earth mass planets. Now, the, now how did they figure that out? Well, it's actually pretty simple. If you think of this pulsar as a clock, and we know that the speed of light is finite, if this pulsar is slightly moving away or towards us, you can imagine the time it takes that clock, that clock signal to reach us will have a slightly variable delay in time. And so because the gravity of the planets cause a slight motion of the pulsar as they orbit each other, this pulsar is moving very slowly away and towards us as the, as the Earth mass objects are going around it. And that introduces a very small lag in time which is detected because these things are so st ultra stable that we can actually detect these very small time delays. That was a, a, a something left over after supernova explosion. In fact, now, after, after a fair amount of study, people think that those planets were actually formed after the supernova in the, all the explosions, some of the ex leftover of the star that didn't completely get blown away, reformed into planets. And so, Although we're calling that a planet right now, it's clearly a very different kind of formation process, a very different kind of place. I mean, there's not going to be any life there, for instance, or anything like that, presumably. So we'll call it, for now, a planet. And it's historically very important, but it's going to be a very, it's not really what we're looking for. I mean, this, this method is not really going to be a method we want to pursue much for, for at least the purposes of finding uh, ter normal terrestrial planets like our own. But so the first extrasolar planet was discovered, uh, well, the, it's around the star 51 Peg, which is about 50 light years away, so relatively nearby. 50 light years is sort of in the, what we kind of call in the solar neighborhood. It, it's, it's not that close, but it's, it's in the vicinity. And when, we talk, when I talk about, quote, nearby stars, which are stars that are pretty bright and easy to study and ones that we might consider sending a probe or going to in, in some distant future, I'm thinking of sort of 50 to 100 light years away. It was discovered by Swiss, two Swiss astronomers right here, Michel Mayer and Didier Kelos. And they found that the star, the way they figured out a planet was there is they observed the star was wobbling back and forth relative to the Earth with a speed, a typical speed of about 50 meters per second, which in our units, miles per hour, you see, is a, is a sort of a terrestrial speed. So they're able to detect again, the motion of the, the main star moving back and forth at 110 miles per hour as this planet of around 51 peg orbits it. You're seeing properties of the star that's changing, and we're inferring things about the planet. So what we find is that this planet is, very high, is fairly high mass. It's about half a Jupiter mass, so 
again, we can call it a Jupiter, a Jupiter-like planet. But its period is very, very strange. You see, it has a 4.2 day period. This is well within the orbit of Mercury in our, in our solar system. It's a 20th of an astronomical unit. In fact, this is why it was so easy to discover when, you know, gravity, strength of gravity increases as you get closer to, to a body. And so this planet is having a disproportionately large effect on the star compared to, say, our Jupiter, which is, again, way out at five astronomical units. It has a much less effect, a factor of at least five, about five times less effect, okay? So this made it relatively easy to see. And it led to the term a hot Jupiter because this thing is, is just getting roasted. Its, its temperature at the surface is, is going to be over 1,000 degrees Kelvin. So it's, it's a really unusual planet. It was a complete surprise, you know, completely unpredicted by the, our theories of, of planet formation. We, in fact, we have to create a, a multi-step process in our current ideas to get a Jupiter mass planet that close. We don't, even today, we don't think it formed there but it somehow moved there. It's called the radial velocity method. And the idea is that uh, stars have atoms in their atmosphere that are kind of like clocks. You probably have heard that every atom, every element has a distinct spectral signature. That is, they give off radiation, light, ray, light waves with particular combination of frequencies, wavelengths of light. And so we know from Earth what the, those frequencies are. So the light from these atoms appear either slightly redder then they're, then they're supposed to be or slightly bluer, and we see this repeating itself every time the planet makes a full orbit. You see, as it moves away, the light red shifts, and as it moves towards you, it blue shifts. This is called the Doppler effect, the fact that the frequency of light or sound or almost anything will change if the, if the source of the sound is moving away or towards you. And so here's a sound. It's going to be loud. Um, but I'm just going to swing it, and it's going to be very easy to hear that the pitch is higher when it's moving towards you, and it goes down as it's going to be moving away from you. So you'll hear it. I'm sure you all heard that, right? It's very dramatic. And as someone who grew up in Indianapolis, um, I'm used to hearing the race cars going around <laughs> from my house, actually. So I was very familiar with the Doppler effect. Now, unlike previous claims of, direct de of detections of extrasolar planets, <coughs> this one was actually confirmed almost instantly. There are, uh, there are other groups in the world looking for extrasolar planets, um, including, famously, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler in California. Everyone thought that you needed to have extremely high precision measurements to detect a planet because we knew, we thought every solar system was going to look like ours. We thought Jupiter was going, there's going to be a Jupiter mass planet, it's going to be 5 AU or so, and we could calculate how much accuracy you needed in your radial velocity method. And so they were working very hard to get that at, at the level needed to find solar systems like the, uh, like the, like the solar system, planets in the solar system. They also weren't necessarily in a big rush because Jupiter takes 12 years to go around. And so to really know that you detected a planet, you have to watch it repeat. You can't just see some goofy change in the data and then call it a planet. You want to see it repeat. And so they kind of, I think they were partly uh, you know, taking it easy in some sense because uh, they knew they had to collect a lot of data to really convince anyone. So they were working hard. But they didn't, they weren't, they, other people had looked for planets and didn't see any, and so they thought there aren't going to be any easy ones. But as a result of this, because once this was discovered and people realized there may be all these planets that are just going to be out there to be found, they, they, got, they borrowed a bunch of computers from people at Berkeley. They were at San Francisco State. They were not as famous as they are now. People thought they maybe were a little bit, you know, doing really risky science because, you know, no one had found any extrasolar planets yet uh, around normal stars. But in fact, as we know, they were really visionary in, in being pursuing this approach. And they found within a year of this first discovery, they found six new planets. So you, it's an incredible advance. And this was a time that I was at, I was at a graduate student at Berkeley during this time. So it was pretty just exciting to hear about all this you know, big change and everything going on just in another building nearby. And much to you know, Berkeley's credit, once 
they found a few planets, then they started to believe in them more and give them more uh, resources and things like that. But at the beginning, they were a lot more stingy, I can tell you that. Uh, so here's a brief summary of the first three planets that were found. It's just that, again, this talk is not to tell you everything about all the extrasolar planets, but the big deal is that there, there's a number of these massive planets very close in. That was the big thing. These things, hot Jupiters or warm Jupiters, Again, they are not expected. This one, as you see, about turns out to be about half a Jupiter mass, eight Jupiter masses, four Jupiter masses, and all within the orbit of Mars. I mean, what our Mars's orbit is for us. Uh, furthermore, some of these are not particularly circular orbits. That's another surprise. This one, for instance, uh, 70 Virginis, uh, is actually quite elliptical. You know, almost a two to one between the closest approach and the uh, farthest approach. Again, totally, we have some eccentric systems in our solar system, but nothing that eccentric. We have to now have a new definition of a planet, and we don't really have an official one yet. The International Astronomical Union has set up a working group to try to come up with a good working definition. To, for something to be called a planet, it has to satisfy all three of these. One is it has to be less massive than a brown dwarf. Now, a brown dwarf, for those who don't know, is, is brown dwarf is something massive enough to fuse deuterium in its core. So it means a planet cannot be fusing atoms together. That's the first thing. Because then it's some version of a star if it's doing nuclear fusion. That's the idea of it. So brown dwarf is a kind of a, kind of a star because it is doing fusion. But it's, we call it a brown dwarf. A star is something which fuses normal hydrogen. So this is a good physically motivated definition of what a star is, a brown dwarf, and an upper limit for what a planet is. Planets do not fuse. And, if, and this is a theoretical number at the moment, but we think that means that it needs to be below about 13 Jupiter masses. That seems to be, according to models, where you would start fusing deuterium. So planets have to be less than 13 Jupiter masses. A second uh, definition is a planet has to be at least as massive as Pluto, although actually what it says is a planet has to be at least as massive as the least massive planet in the solar system thinking ahead to the day when the Pluto may become uh, demoted as a planet, I think. But for the moment, Pluto is still a planet, and so uh, this sets a lower limit of 1 500th of an Earth mass. So it's a pretty good range of masses. Remember, the difference between Jupiter and Earth is th about 300. And the third point has a bit of politics in it. You can probably tell by looking at it. Uh, and this is why we probably really won't have a definition for 50 years after everyone is dead who made these discoveries. And that is that a planet must, as of now, orbit a star, not a brown dwarf, by the way, a star or a stellar remnant, which, of course, means this allows the Pluto planets to still be called planets, right? I think, in reality, we might not want this to be a general definition, but for the moment it is. And again, you see the politics. This, and it says here it has to be not free-floating because soon after the discoveries of the extrasolar planets, people using Hubble Space Telescope found a bunch of really low-mass objects in star-forming regions that were the same mass as planets. And that people called them free-floating planets because there are these planets that are just flying around with no star attached to them. And to sort of just stop that in its tracks and say, stop calling those planets, they added number three here that you're not supposed to call those planets. So uh, a planet must orbit a star or a stellar remnant as of today. But like I say, these are, these are always being negotiated, I think. This is a plot of the number of published papers in referee journals uh, with the words extrasolar planet in the abstract. And you can see the first one that I could find was 1974. And that, may, I don't know, it may just be a fact that people use different terminology b at before a certain point. I'm not sure. But you see that for about 20 years here, we had about one, one or two papers a year. Interestingly, they tended to be in very high-profile journals like Nature and Science. It's sort of funny. But there weren't very many. Um, here's a spike that happened after the pulsar planets. People got excited, wrote some more papers. But you can see what really, really drove the field here is after the 51 peg discovery and all the planets that came after that, there has been a huge increase. And at this point now, we have about one paper per week that comes out in the, in the referee literature on extrasolar planets in some way or another. That's probably an undercount. There's probably more that I ha didn't even include, but at least one a week. Uh, in fact, in the, in the latest reorganization of NASA, 
uh, finding Earth-like planets has been elevated to a top-level priority on the same level as preparing robotic missions to Mars and going to Mars. It's a high-level goal now in NASA to, uh, to conduct, quote, advanced telescope searches for Earth-like planets and habitable environments around other stars. And I should, I should emphasize, I, I, I've sort of downplayed it, but one reason, one thing that's backdropping this entire obsession about finding Earth-like planets is not just because we want to find things like us, but it is the, the greater question of finding uh, life in the universe, that we want to find a habitable planet, something that life could be on. And there's a lot of work, you know, at Mars trying to find exotic life forms outside of Earth. And so one reason we're a bit obsessed here with Earth-like planets is because of, of that concern. We want to find some place that, to, if we're going to study, and it's really hard to do this, these experiments, we want to go after, you know, the whole thing and go for some place that also may have life on it. Last time I checked, there's 152 extrasolar planets now known around about 136 stars, which tells you that some, some of these stars have multiple planets have been found. Uh, so far, out of a few thousand, this, out of about a couple thousand stars that have been searched carefully, about 7% have Jupiter mass planets around them. Now, it, this is a lower limit because, right, because the surveys haven't gone on long enough. They won't, they're not going to have found Jupiter-like planets that are very far from the star. So there have been 7% found so far, but that number is going to increase as we keep observing these stars and look for the, the larger orbit planets. And just to get a feeling for 7%, just I was curious to try this. So there's a few hundred, let's say three or 400 people here that represents uh, you know, the very closest stars you know, within, say, a few dozen light years. Okay, And if we... If we say, OK, let's say we searched all of you for planets to get a feeling for how many of you would have planets in this search, if everyone with a birthday between January 1st and January 26th, raise your hand. So this gives you a feeling for when you look up in the sky at all the stars you see, that is the number that we know have planets from our searches. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic, I think, shift in our picture from yeah, there's probably planets, because why not, to we know there are, that we are, there are a lot of planets out there. Uh, another interesting pattern arising is there's, there's more smaller planets than big planets. What I mean by that is there are more, you know, one solar mass, one Jupiter mass planets than two Jupiter mass planets, you know, more two than three, three than four, that as we become more sensitive to finding lower mass planets, we can see more and more of them. They're harder to find, so we don't actually have more of them. But if we correct for those effects, that they're harder to find, we actually think that there's more and more as you go down. Okay, So that we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, basically. That as we learn more, we're going to find a, you know, ex, sort of exponentially more planets as we get more sensitive in our methods. We can already see that with this 150, first 150 planets. And, and uh, a last point to make is that while there was a lot of attention given in the press that all these early planets were very weird and unlike the solar system, it's known that that was mostly because the techniques found those weird ones most easily, right? They found the Jupiters that were very close to the star. That, in fact, that's all they could see. They, even today, it'd be almost impossible with the current data to find Jupiter in a Jupiter orbit because Jupiter's orbit is 12 years, and the surveys have barely, barely been going on that long. And so we don't want to overinterpret this, this, uh, the fact that we find so many weird planets. In fact, there's probably going to be plenty of solar systems that are analogous to ours, and they are starting to emerge out of the data. The first solar system-like arrangement, so to speak, was this Upsilon Andromeda system of three planets in, oriented in cir roughly circular orbits and you know, nested circles which seem to satisfy our orig one of our earlier definitions of what a planet should be. So we're seeing these systems. These are all close in. Uh, sorry, here, it's super, this is the orbit of Mars here. So you see one of these planets is on a larger orbit, something that would be like the asteroid belt, or inside, inside of the asteroid belt. But uh, you see that we're starting to find these. And as we spend more time looking, we're, going to be, we're basically enlarging the radius that we're sensitive to. Uh, in terms of Michigan, you'd probably be interested to know that Michigan faculty are part of some of these radial velocity searches. 
Uh, there's a, one that's recently started on the Magellan Telescope called the Magellan Planet Search. And Fred Adams, who has already talked in this series, and I think we'll talk one more time, he is involved in some of this work. Um, and the University of Michigan is a major partner in these telescopes, uh, which are, in the, in, like I say, in the southern hemisphere. And so a lot of the surveys to date have been done in the northern hemisphere. And so this opens up a, a, new, a bunch of new stars to do sensitive searches for. The lowest mass planet found to date here is this one, uh, 14 Earth masses, which is about the mass of Uranus. Um, it's, but what's weird about it is it's very close. Again, you would, they, they couldn't detect Uranus or Neptune. It's too far away uh, if, in our system. But if you put that, much, that low of a mass very, very close, again, inside the orbit of Mercury, they can detect that now. So we're, the, again, the techniques are really improving. And so the question about that is whether we should think of it as a super Earth or a low mass Jupiter. It's sort of getting in between those two limits. So we're starting to think about Earth-like planets in some way now, even with radial velocity methods. But the prospects for radial velocity methods for finding Earths, though, is not good. And this is why I'm going to stop talking about it. It's been very successful. There's no doubt about it. it by far, almost all the known planets have been found this way. Um, and as I just pointed out, Neptune mass objects very close to the star are now becoming detectable. However, it's, it's limited by the fact that this, if you've ever seen pictures of the sun with our satellites, you know that there's lots of activity on the sun. There's convection, there's roiling motions on the surface, there's flares, there's stellar oscillations. There's a lot of stuff going on in the sun. And eventually, that's going to catch up with you and limit how well you can tweak out, tease out, I mean, a signal of this back and forth motion by a, a low mass planet. Um, if, if 51 Peg was this race car racing around, uh, Jupiter has an effect of someone running fast. A, a, Ju a real Jupiter, a Jupiter at 5 AU, okay? A Jupiter like the Earth, or like the solar system's Jupiter, will cause the uh, sun to move back and forth at sort of the 100 yard dash kind of speed, 12 meters per second, okay? A human speed. That's already pretty impressive that we can think to detect that. The, to detect an Earth, though, we have to detect something 100 times less, so 10 centimeters per second, you know, sort of this speed. We'd have to detect the average motion of, of a star moving this, you know, speed towards us for half the year and turning around and going back that fast for half of the year. And again, because of these violent motions on the surface, we think that this is just not, not going to be possible. But you never know. I shouldn't say it won't be possible, because people, astronomers are often good at coming up with tricks. And they already have pushed the method beyond what people said it could do five years ago. Uh, maybe a better method for finding Earth-like planets. It's, this method is called the transit method. And you can visually see a beautiful example of this here. Here is Venus in its recent transit of the sun just last year, which is a fairly rare event for us to see this. Uh, and Venus, recall, is the same size as the Earth, almost exactly. And so you can see that when, if you happen to be viewing a star and a planet from just the right angle, you can see occasionally what's called a transit. The, there's an, a little, very partial eclipse of the sun, which causes the overall brightness of the sun to dim by a fraction of a percent for a few hours and then go bright again. And it happens once a year or once in orbit. So. This obviously sounds like a hard method, but it's a method to try. Looking for this effect in other stars, looking to see if we can see a periodic, distinctive dimming of a star that would fit with this kind of idea. You expect to see uh, the planet go in front of the star and cause an eclipse and the, and the light to go down. This is the first data, successful data of this that was taken in 1999. It was a star HD 209458. It was not discovered, uh, the planet was not discovered this way. This was actually a planet that had been already just recently discovered using the radial velocity method. So the, those discoverers doing the radial velocity method knew about this idea, and they would say, hey, I, we just found a planet, and I'm telling you know, my, my friend in advance, why don't you look at it before we publish it you know, so we can you know, be the first to discover these transits. So as they were getting the data, when they far, first saw that there was this a planet there, they would go tell their collaborators who do photometry to go look for the transits. And it took, though, five year, four or five years to actually come up with one. And that's because, again, the probability is very low, right? You have to be viewing these planets from just the right angle to have an eclipse. 
So it, it's, a, it's a method that is uh, unlikely to be valid for any single system, but if you look at enough systems, then you know from probability you're going to get lucky at least a certain number of times. So it's a, it's a tough game, but astronomers like tough games. Um, this is, uh, sorry, this was the ground-based discovery uh, spect uh, uh, light curve. It's called a light curve. Relative flux is one. It goes down by about one and a half percent, and it goes up, back up. Now, we're limited from the ground because of, you know, you've seen that stars twinkle if you look up. The atmosphere causes distortions. We have a very limited amount of precision that you can do from the ground because of these effects. And so this was laid, looked at by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see this incredible precision here. It, the error bars, as you can tell, are about the size of the points, at least in the, some of the area. And it's just a an, an vast improvement in the, in the uh, sensitivity. And you can start to imagine now being able to see very, very small transits with data quality like this. This system was easy. It was a Jupiter-sized planet. But if you imagine it being 100 times smaller, it's going to get hard, but maybe not impossible for, for Earth's. So the status report for the transit is that there hasn't been that many confirmed planets discovered by the transit method. There are about five, uh, although there's many more candidates. Uh, the transit depth actually tells you the size of the planet, which is a new piece of information. The radial velocity methods tell you the mass. The transits tell you the size. So putting those together is very valuable for studying planets. Uh, Again, a point here is to do this, you have to study a lot of stars. And because that's because the orbits have to be aligned edge on. This is very unlikely to be true for the closest star system, just by probability. And so you have to look at you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of stars if you want to be guaranteed to find a large number of, of planets. Um, and, what, and the downside of that, then, is that there turned out to be many more false positives than people first thought when they tried this. For instance, what if you have a binary star, boring binary star, right, going around, but what if it just happens to barely nick one of the stars in a partial eclipse, just barely have an eclipse? Well, that's kind of tricky to tell apart from a planet. And so, again, if you're looking at millions of stars, you're going to get these really weird cases popping up that people didn't really appreciate. You have the case of a normal binary star eclipsing, okay? It might be a huge eclipse. But what if there happens to be a star right behind it that dilutes it? So you can't tell from your telescope there's three stars. You think there's only one binary star. And it makes it look like it's a very weak effect when actually it's just there's an extra star there. So there's all these pathological cases that people discovered, much to their disappointment, I should say, uh, when they did these surveys. So it's, that's why it's, we only have about five now. So Jupiter mass planets are easy. OK, but it is going to be possible to do Earth-like planets. They validated the precision with, again, you saw some of the improvement from the Hubble. They're doing a lot of studies with uh, CCD detectors for high stability. And this is a mission in an advanced stage of planning called the Kepler mission. It's a space telescope, very small telescope, but made to be very precise in its calibration. And it will survey 100,000 nearby stars and determine in a statistical sense for the first time how many Earth-like planets are out there. They're not going to be necessarily close to us because, again, the transit method has all these things that throw out most of the systems if the orbits aren't right. But if you, if you survey 100,000, we're probably going to have you know, 100 or so Earth-like planets in that 100,000 that happen to have the right orbit. And this is a, a, a very exciting mission that's actually meant to launch in just a few years. And this is really going to be really direct a lot of, of our research after this point. Because we need to know how many Earth-like planets there are. How unique is the Earth out there? And this will give us the statistical answer. You know, just like we know that 7% of stars have a Jupiter-like planet right now, this is going to tell us, you know, whatever. Maybe it's 100% of stars. Maybe stars have more than one Earth-like planet on average. Maybe they only have, you know, only 1 in 10. We don't actually have any good idea, and this is going to definitively tell us the answer. All the methods I've talked about are so-called indirect methods, but this is called a direct method, because what, this is called a secondary eclipse. And this is a much weaker effect, but you would expect the planet to go behind the star as well as in front of the star. But there, what you see is that the planet's light is being dimmed. And I haven't really talked much about the planet's light, because so far we haven't needed to. But planets give off their own light. It's either reflected light, 
from the star, or it's, it's heat radiation, depending on its temperature. It's giving off infrared light. And so you want to look for that. It's much weaker effect, though. People have tried to do this from the ground, but because of all the problems of ground-based astronomy, they have, not, they have failed. But using the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, which was launched a few years ago, they were able to do this. In fact, two, people, two different people did it the same month, Deming and Charbonneau. And they, this is the raw data from the recent paper. You see it was time so that the secondary eclipse was happening right in the center here. This little glitch is just some problem at the telescope, some telemetry housekeeping functions that just happen to be right in the middle. Um, but if you average that data together, you see this very weak fraction of a percent dip. It's not that impressive of a detection, but you can see, you can clearly see that it goes down during that secondary eclipse. So this is really a historic plot, because this is the first time that we say that we know that we have seen light, photons from an extrasolar planet, for the first time here. We can now do this at different wavelengths. We can now measure a spectrum of the star. We can directly say the temperature. We can start to say what it's made out of. All these things follow once you actually detect light from the star. You can do amazing things now with this method. Granted, only on about five stars so far, but you just have to start somewhere. So what you'd really like to do is just take a snapshot of a solar system. Wouldn't that be easier? You just to see all the planets, and you just see how far away they are. You just measure their spectrum. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Uh, so why don't we just take a picture? Well, there's a, there's a couple of fundamental reasons. We have what's called diffraction of light. Light is a, has wave properties, and these waves suffer what's called diffraction. So what you see here is a laser spotter that's coming out of this system here. And just to show you the scale, it's about one millimeter in size. Now, I, I have a... Uh, just a plate here that makes it fainter because it saturates the camera when it's direct like that. So just wanted to show you the real size is about a millimeter. If I take it out, it saturates it so it looks larger. Now the bottom shows you the aperture that we're putting the light through. So you see that if you try to squeeze light into an aperture, it will spread out depending on its wavelength. And you, can, you should be able to see this pretty easily here. You start to see interference effects, those rings and slightly unintuitively, the smaller I make it, the larger the spot going through it. I mean, normally you would think if you have a large hole, it makes a large spot, and you make the hole smaller, it, it would make a small spot. But once you get too small, then it starts to spread out. And if I increase the size, it gets smaller. And here it starts to saturate. So this is diffraction in the extreme. You can see it visually. But in fact, this happens even with very large holes or apertures, such as telescopes. So if we try to make an image through a telescope, there is going to be unavoidably a small amount of blurring from diffraction that will tend to blur two objects together. So they overlap, and so you, know, you won't be able to tell them apart. And this is not even worrying about turbulence, which is a big problem from the ground. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a bright star. Here, these are some bright stars in Orion, and you see that uh, you see these spikes, which come from, uh, they're another kind of a diffraction effect that happens. And then you see this sort of halo of light around it, which comes from, for instance, imperfect optics, scattering off of small particles of dust that are on the mirror. Anything you can think of will cause some of this really bright light to get spread out from where it's supposed to be and, and mess up or interfere with of trying to find, say, a, a very faint planet right next to this thing. Earth is about 10 billion times fainter than the sun, OK? So if we have a spot, this, this lighthouse, you, you're trying to pick out this very faint source of light right next to the lighthouse. And to get, a, again, a factor of 10 billion is about a lightning bug compared to a lighthouse. And in terms of the angular resolution, to give you a feeling for that, is if you were to look in the sky and, and try to see the Earth and, and a sun, it's like it's the same, uh, it's, it would be the same difficulty as trying to see my hands here if I walk away from you and stop in California. So you're trying to find something 10 billion times brighter than this viewing here from a distance of California. This is why we don't just take an image. 
of course, people still want to take images, and they still want to find planets. And of course, just like radio velocity methods got very lucky to find these hot Jupiters, maybe the imagers will get lucky and find all these really far big Jupiters that are way out in the solar system that we can find. And here was a first direct image, claim of a direct image of a planet, right here. You see this little point of light? We have a, actually a binary system here, and it looks to be an arc of dust coming out, and at the end of this arc of dust is a point, and there was a, a, an idea that maybe this was a planet that was shot out it, because it got too close to one of these stars. Unfortunately, it turned out that this object, just by bad luck, happened to be a distant star that was just happened to be behind it. So it was faint, and it was red, but it wasn't a planet. It was just another star. But this led to a lot of timidity after this point in the astronomers not to publish images of stars, because this was a bit of a mess, I think, because this got a lot of press by NASA. And uh, anyway, there's been, so everyone would publish so-called candidate planet images after this, which <laughs> got a lot less press, as it should, and so that's fine. But there's been a recent rash of new images being published just this year. Uh, this was published in September, and it was, con it was confirmed in just, last, just a few months ago uh, in the sense that it's not a background object. So this faint thing next to this bright thing is not a background object. It is probably in orbit around uh, this star. But the, and so this was saying as a first extrasolar planet, it's a, a little unusual, 55 AU, so it's farther than the Pluto to Sun distance. Uh, which is interesting. It's also really massive. It's like five Jupiter masses. So it's almost as massive as you can get, and it's way out beyond Pluto. So it's really, a, it's just what we were hoping for, right? Some really weird new kind of planet. The only glitch with this discovery is that this is a brown dwarf, and which makes it easier to see, right? Brown dwarfs are a lot fainter than stars. So it's not going to be a 10 billion to one difficult problem. It's much easier than that. But according to some people, if, if it's around a brown dwarf, it doesn't count as a planet. Sorry. So this is now relegated to be called a planetary mass object. It doesn't have a good definition what it is. Uh, this came out last week, in fact. So this it was it came out on April Fool's Day, uh, which is already a bad sign. And this is, uh, this is actually now claimed to be the first image of a planet around a sun-like star, not a brown dwarf. So this might really be a planet. This separation is even more, by the way. This is 100 AU, OK? So almost three times the distance of Pluto. Like, we don't even think there's anything in our solar system practically beyond 100 AU, not even comets for the most part, very few, if any. So this is really out there. It's also incredibly bright. This is 150 times fainter than that, which is kind of easy to see, as you can tell. Now, the, only, the reason it's so bright is because young planets uh, have self-heat. They're not just reflecting light. They have self-heat because they're still contracting. They're very young. They're still hot from the formation. They haven't cooled off yet. And so this is the explanation why this is a planet, even though it looks like a star or a brown dwarf. And I've seen some new press releases. And I, I, it seems to me that this is not going to stand the, the test. It's very difficult to, to estimate the mass of this thing based on what we see here. We don't have a radial velocity. We don't have a direct measurement of the mass. It all depends on theoretical models. And everyone I can talk to thinks this is a brown dwarf. Now, maybe I'm talking to Americans, and this is a European discovery. So maybe there's some politics here. Uh, I have faith that it will be sorted out in the long run. But this was I just wanted to mention because it's really fresh and sort of shows science in action. But it does worry me that, th that people are publishing these things without as much care as they have been in the last sort of five years. People have been quite having a lot of restraint to not make big deals about things unless you know, they're really going to be believed. So to do this, they used a, a number of tricks. They used wide separations. They were young systems. And they observed in the infrared wavelength that they weren't observing in the visible light. And this is because a lot planets give off, as I mentioned, their own emission, their own heat. And cooler objects give off heat, give off radiation in the infrared. So this is a plot showing the sun's radiation as a function of wavelength. So this is microns of wavelength. This rainbow is showing you the visible, what we see. And you can see the sun compared to the Earth is huge. It's about a 10 to the 10, which is, again, 10 billion times fainter. But if we go into the infrared, this is where the Earth is starting to 
come up and it's creating its own light from, its, from being at room temperature, from being at, you know, 300 Kelvin. And luckily, at the same time, the sun is starting to go down in brightness because it's peaking in the visible. It's hot. And so that combination means that a 10 billion to 1 problem becomes more like a 10 million to 1 problem, which is still a problem, but is uh, a 1,000 times better. A local company, FLIR, loaned me this infrared camera. And these infrared cameras are used now uh, for various industrial purposes, to look for heat leaks in your house or look for overheating components in your electronics. So we kind of have a t double camera here. We have visible in the little inset here. And here we have in the infrared. Oh. <laughs> wow, you guys are warm. When I tested this out without anyone there, it didn't look like this. Uh, so you can see people's eyeglasses are much cooler than their skin temperature. And you can see both the visible and the infrared here. But of course, what's most dramatic is if we completely cut the lights. I don't know if that's going to be easy. And you can see why you want to look for planets in the, in the, vis in the infrared, because we are we are just really pumping out photons in the infrared. And you see there's basically, the infrared is not even affected by the turning off the lights. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know that the police and everyone use this for various uh, purposes, looking for people in the dark. Um, so uh, we set up a little diorama here of, the, of an extrasolar planetary system. And one nice thing about this setup is the scale is not that far off for 51 peg. OK, so I didn't have a good scale representation of 51 peg. Earth on this scale would be you know, outside the building somewhere. OK, so this is how close this planet is. So we see here, we have a system here. Uh, we have here uh, the visible light. And in the visible, all you see is the reflected light. Okay? In fact, people have looked for the reflected light for 51 peg and haven't seen it. And because they haven't seen it, we know that 51 peg is more black than it is white. It doesn't reflect much light, or they would have seen it. The low reflectivity planet, you don't really see. And, but in the infrared, um, in fact, you see this bright one, which is being heated. You can't see the heat visually, but in the infrared, it's very obvious. Now, this one you would think you should see it because it's at room temperature, right? You should see this white ping pong ball here, warm. But the reason you can't is because the background is also at room temperature. So they blend into each other. Like, I'm above room temperature, so you can see it eclipsing my hand. And I don't know if we have any spritz, but we have, we can cool off the background here, like, which would be more like space. You know, if you're looking at, through, looking at a planet through space, it would be cooler. So if we spray it, evaporative cooling is cooling off the background. And you can see that you can see this room temperature light quite easily. One of the ways we want to make progress in being able to find extrasolar planets with imaging is we have to build really large telescopes so that this diffraction limit, we can overcome it and improve on it so we can see some extrasolar planets. This is a drawing of the next, what we hope will be the next world's largest telescope. It's called the Giant Magellan Telescope. Each one of these individual telescopes is about the size of the world's largest telescope now. So it'll be, consist of seven times as much collecting area, 25 meters across. This will allow, hopefully, to directly image the outer planets of nearby solar systems. It won't be good enough, as you'll see, to find Earth. But it will be good enough to see some of the larger planets in nearby solar systems. The first mirror was, in fact, already purchased and is starting to be ground. And University of Michigan is a founding member of this consortium. Um, and we're currently in the process of trying to raise the very large amount of money we need to, uh, to complete the construction of this. Um, again, this is going to really revolutionize not just extrasolar planets and being able to allow us to make images of nearby systems and disks and planet formation, but it also the amount of, new, of, of collecting area will also be used towards looking at the high redshift universe, which you heard about in previous talks. So this is, a, again, a big effort in our department to try to get this going and to keep ourselves at this cutting edge, which will really, I think, set the stage for the big discoveries of the next sort of 20 or 30 years will be from telescopes like this. 
So do, do direct the terrestrial planets, again, Earth-like planets, very close to their star compared to Jupiter, we're going to need even larger telescopes than that. Uh, it's made worse by the fact that we, need to, we want to operate in the infrared, and diffraction is worse with the longer your waves are. So we're going, it's, we need essentially a 20 times larger telescope than we would need if we were going to use visible light. So this is obviously a problem. And we currently believe that it's impossible to build such a structure uh, on the ground or in space uh, that would have to be the size of the football field here. So uh, there is a way out. This is a project I work on myself. We're not finding terrestrial planets with it, I must admit. But it's called the Chara Interferometer. And it's a way of creating the angular resolution, or the, the, this ability to make, measure a fine detail, on the cheat, basically. And it's where you just don't build the whole mirror. The idea is we have six small telescopes spread out over a large area. And we combine the light together afterwards as if it came from a large telescope. And so while we don't have a large collecting area, so, that's, so forget about looking at the high redshift universe, you do have extraordinary angular resolution. This would be enough angular resolution to discern not my hands this far apart in California, but to discern you know, the size of one fingertip in California. So a factor of, again, 20 times better. Again, just for your sense of scale, uh, this is larger than the whole Michigan Stadium. And again, this can resolve now Earth-Sun distances out to 2,000 light years, which is well beyond what we consider our solar neighborhood. So for this kind of separation, angular resolution is not going to be a problem. So I'm getting to, to my last part of the talk here. Uh, and it has to do with a little bit more about interferometry. And interferometry gives you one more trick that you need to get rid of this contrast problem. So remember, there are two problems with imaging. Angular resolution, we got that with the interferometry, but we need the contrast problem, this you know, 10 million to 1 problem. And so we use what a property of light called interference. And you probably have seen, heard of so-called constructive interference and destructive interference. Light is a wave, and if, if you combine light from two different sources together, if, they are, if the timing is just right, you'll have the peaks of one wave coincide with the peaks of the other wave. They'll combine together to be a stronger signal. Okay, So if it's a sound wave, it'll be louder. If it's a light wave, it'll be brighter. Or you can have them time just so that they cancel each other out, that the bright parts are happening at the same time as or the peaks are happening at the same time as the troughs. And then you get, actually, a complete cancellation. And this is how, for instance, the Bose uh, noise cancellation headphones work. Sound is a wave. In this case, they measure that wave and then create a counter-going wave that's opposite and cancel out the noise just locally. So we want to use an interferometer to do this. And, I, and this is the last demo here. So you have to be slightly creative to imagine this being an interferometer. But imagine we have a light source here, which is your star, and it's coming from this microwave radiation. So microwave radiation has a wavelength of this, this one has a wavelength of about two centimeters. So it's a lot easier to deal with than, than other wavelengths, than much shorter wavelengths. So you see this light can go off of these two mirrors. They don't look very good mirrors to you, but because the spacing in the grid is less than a wavelength, the waves will bounce off it very effectively. So to the microwaves, this is, looks like a perfect mirror. So this light is spreading out. Part of it will bounce into the detector this path. Part of it will bounce out through the detector in that path. Now, people in the front might barely hear something, but it's on right now. And you don't hear much. And again, the idea is that you have two different waves coming through two different paths. And we've made it just now so that they're exactly half of a wavelength different, or yeah, half of a wavelength different in path length so that they cancel out here. And to prove that, you may think I just it's broken because you don't hear anything. But you can show this because I can block one and block the other, and you hear that it's actually working. So let's hope this works. So we'll block one. So that now the light is only going through path two. It destructively cancels out this one. Or I block this one, and you hear that one. So the idea is to combine light. On this, from a star over hundreds of meters, make the path length exactly cancel out for your star 
so that you can then try to see the planet. And just this, you might ask, well, why doesn't this cancel out the planet as well? Well, it's because you might see here, a planet will be coming from a slightly different direction. So its geometry will be slightly different. And you can see this here. Here's the, if this is the star, I can move this from a slightly different angle. And you can get even constructive interference where the planet is, for instance. Well, you'll certainly get something different. And so you can use an interferometer to selectively choose to erase the light from certain directions and let the light through in others. And so you essentially do something like a filter on the sky like this so that you can try to detect the planets around bright stars. So the, so the plan, let me turn this off. The plan then, this is really my basically the end of the talk. You're putting all this together. We have a plan. It's a very ambitious plan, but we do have a plan to find Earth-like planets now. We need to go to the thermal infrared because of the contrast. We need to go to space, well, for many reasons, but one reason I didn't tell you is that because there's so much warm light around us, it, inter it causes interference in the measurement and will swamp the signal from a very faint Earth. So we need to go to space for that reason. We need everything around us to be cold. We need an interferometer for angular resolution and for nulling to get rid of the light. And it turns out, just to make it even harder, we need very large telescopes, at least from space-based perspective, to collect enough light to see the Earth, because they are faint. They're, they're not just faint compared to the star. They're also pretty faint by themselves. So we need a pretty large telescope. And this, all these principles are being organized into a plan called the Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer in the US by NASA. And the European Space Agency has a very similar design called Darwin. And so we're trying to work together to come up with a, a workable design. But each of these different techniques is pushing the limit. We don't have a five meter telescope in space that's thermal, that's cold. You know, we don't have an interferometer in space yet. You know, we don't have a lot of this stuff actually working, even separately. We have a lot of progress. Um, we're doing the, we've only, we have, well, we're doing nulling interferometry tests on the ground now. So all of this is in the future, and we're talking about 15 years maybe. And it's probably going to be longer, to be honest. But. So this is this uh, committee that I'm on to help plan this. So maybe before I die, this will be uh, going. <laughs> this is just a simulation of what you might be able to see with this. And it may not look very impressive to you, but maybe that will get across how hard this is. Even with all this technology working as planned, this would be what the inner solar system looks like. This is, this is Venus, this is Earth, and this is Mars. And these are just artifacts from the image that they make. So you can see, even, even, with, a, even with an ideal system, it's going to be a very hard thing to do. But it, it can be done, at least on paper. So just to end my talk, I want to just point, go to this quote by Giordano Bruno. He was much after Epicurus. He was during the time of Galileo. And he thought that there would be a lot more uh, worlds out there. He was, he was quoted to say there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our solar system. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse or no less inhabited than Earth. And uh, I, I just want to hope that you'll be treating me a little more kindly than Giardino Bruno was treated. Uh, he happened to be uh, the last victim of the Roman Inquisition. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. <laughs>